and welcome to the Houston Methodist Heart and Vascular Institute live series revolving around digital health and telemedicine. My name is Ahmed Solomon. I'm a cardiologist here at Houston Methodist. Over the last few months, as we have been going through the COVID-19 crisis, telemedicine has become a household name and a very important aspect of how we manage patients in what felt like an overnight change. Many learned very quickly what some of us have been advocating for many years, how valuable telemedicine is to the practice of medicine in general and more specifically in the practice of cardiovascular diseases. The implementation of telemedicine has taken off much faster than any of us would have imagined in circumstances none of us would have wished for, but it's now out of the box. The goal for this series is to discuss and understand the implementation of telemedicine well beyond the current crisis. Cardiologists have the opportunity and should be at the forefront of how things will be changing in our practices in the very near future. Over the last month or so, our country has been going through a turmoil, a recurrent turmoil of injustices that fall on minorities. This is not just a political discussion. This is a medical one. But it is clear that injustices are not just political, but also stem from many aspects, including medical and social. Dr. King once said, of all the forms of equality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. The topic for this session was not chosen during the last few weeks during the recent events. But I chose this, frankly, after the early data from COVID-19 pandemic has made it even more clear and, frankly, saddening that minorities were taking in a disproportionate percentage of the morbidity and mortality during this crisis. While they were already taking in a burden, uh, a significant burden, of cardiovascular diseases before this. We are here today to discuss this and how telemedicine and virtual care can provide a more accessible and cost-effective service. Today I'm honored to welcome three very special guests. Um, I'll present them all first and then we can start our talk. Um, also please note if you want to interact with any of our guests today with a comment or a question, uh, please text it to 37, uh, I'm sorry, text DeBakey to 37607 or online at polyv.com debakey. Um, it should be on the bottom of your screen or the side on the top. <clears throat> Our first guest um, is Dr. Amy Bott. Dr. Bott is the um, Liberson Endowed Scholar in Adult Congenital Heart Disease. She's the Director of Outpatient Cardiology and Telecardiology at Mass General Harvard Medical School, in addition to many other roles and responsibilities within the ACC. She's a very active cardiologist in the telemedicine world for years, way before COVID. But my interaction with her was recent at the ACC um, CV Summit in February, this last February in DC, um, in her presentations revolving around different approaches to the implementation of telecardiology, which in my opinion, hit the nail on the head. Um, in addition, she's, a very, she's very active in women's health and um, was named the 2020 chairwoman for Go Red for Women in Boston. Welcome, Dr. Bott. Our, um, our next guest is Dr. Jagmeet Singh. So Dr. Singh is a professor of medicine at Mass General Harvard Medical School, and until a few months ago was the clinical chief of cardiology at MGH. Um, he's an electrophysiologist and founding director of resynchronization and advanced cardiac therapeutics. He's the national principal investigator on multi-center clinical trials, member of steering committees, dozens of single and multi-center research studies, um, and on the editorial board of several medical journals, including deputy editor of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, Electrophysiology. I never met Dr. Singh in person yet, um, but in 2018 when I was a graduating fellow, uh, we here at Houston Methods didn't have a telemedicine platform yet, and I personally was intrigued with how efficient and how to the point digital and virtual healthcare delivery can be. I read an editorial for uh, that he wrote in um, Jack EP 2018, uh, Connecting Life with Devices. And while I was reading it, it was on point, almost word for word, of what I was envisioning for the future of digital health, but obviously very elegantly written. The sentence I recall very well and frankly resonates with me until this day um, was a sentence saying that the future was very good and bright, but it will become very complex before it becomes very simple. And during that period of time, we will continuously second guess our choices. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And our third guest today is Dr. Keith Ferdinand. 
Uh, Dr. Ferdinand is a professor of medicine and he is the chair of preventive cardiology at Tulane University. Heavily involved in many national organizations concerned with public health, um, including the Association of Black Cardiologists, ABC, of which um, he was the former chair and chief science officer, board member of the American Society of Hypertension, and multiple programs, including a lot of interesting outreach programs. Um, one of them that I personally admire is Healthy Heart Community Prevention Program which is a cardiovascular risk program targeting African-American and other high-risk populations. His passion for patient care has been highlighted for many years um, for uh, his commitment for nonprofit work and outreach community services, inducted into the Association of University Cardiologists, um, and has had a very recent um, public published article in JAK um, this month, African-American COVID-19 mortality a sentinel event, which I would highly recommend everybody to read. Welcome, Dr. Ferdinand. Pleased to be here. So Dr. Ferdinand will start first um, with a few slides, and we're going to basically open this for um, a general discussion. And again, if you have any comments or questions for our guests, please text the number below. Dr. Ferdinand. Thank you. This is going to be very quick, but I think it's important to set the table because we now have a mixture of not only the need to increase telehealth, COVID-19, but also social justice. And we as physicians and cardiologists cannot practice in a vacuum. This slide, if you look at the citation from 2002, sounds like it may be dated, but unfortunately, it still applies. This is from the Institute of Medicine, their major work called unequal treatment. And the statements that were made at that time stand today. Health, life expectancy, and overall care have improved dramatically for all Americans, but the benefits have not been equal. There is a real mortality gap, not social science, but mortality gap, black versus white, which has been persistent since the 1960s. The primary driver is cardiovascular disease. Blacks have more hypertension, diabetes, obesity, especially in females heart failure, stroke, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, and premature cardiovascular mortality. If you talk then about this gap, you can see going way back into the early 2000s, black males had the shortest life expectancy compared to white males, black females, a disparate life expectancy compared to white females. In fact, the life expectancy of black females is closer to that of white males than to white females, almost removing the benefit of being female. Furthermore, we know that the cardiovascular disease mortality rates for all populations have been improving, but recently there has been a plateauing and even an uptick in overall cardiovascular disease. The top curves show all forms of cardiovascular disease starting to slow and gradually increase the y-axis is the same. Again, we're talking about hard endpoints, mortality, with the obvious disparity comparing whites much lower than that seen in blacks. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that these are genetic factors. There may be some factors, but overall, this is a Venn diagram that I crudely made. Environment, socioeconomic status, life exposures, zip code, have more of an impact than genes in terms of these outcomes. For heart failure, unfortunately, especially in the younger years, the gaps not only are persistent, but may be increasing. Black men here in the blue, black women in the orange, with higher rates of heart failure, there's some diminution in the older age, but that might be because of the healthy survivors. In stage renal disease, which is to a large extent a target organ damage related to hypertension and diabetes, for a population that may be 13%, almost three times that with in stage renal disease. And those of us who don't necessarily see ourselves as being at risk should recognize we pay for this disparity because these patients are approved for disparity payment by Medicare as much as 90 to 130 thousand dollars annually. Life expectancy, the top 1% for women live 10 years 
longer and for men 15 years longer such that politicians and pundits will talk about the median life expectancy being so low in the United States it's actually driven by these disparities directly related to our conversation today I was thinking what do we call this African American and lower socioeconomic status disparity related to COVID-19. I came up with the idea that it was a sentinel event, similar to when the Joint National Committee finds out when looking at a hospital that there are left retained foreign bodies or surgeries done on the wrong patient, patients who fall and break hips. Those are markers for longstanding unacceptable inequities. And COVID-19 doesn't cause these disparities, but it actually unmasks these disparities. It's again not driven by genetics, people who work in essential environments, and people who have to look to other sources for their care often have higher rates of COVID-19. I didn't want to go too fast through this. This is actually in the Jack article that was mentioned. But if you look at the four from the bottom, telemedicine, including home blood pressure monitoring, home skills, being able to consult with patients related to their eating habits, cardiovascular risk control, are very much something that would be beneficial for our patients. And because many patients are at home delaying care for acute cardiovascular events, strokes, and heart failure, we may be able to see the patient and speak to the patient and encourage them to seek appropriate care and overcome their fear of going to the hospital with cardiovascular disease. There's a laundry list of things that I list here. I suggest if you want more information, you can go to the Jack article in which I detailed my concerns along with my colleague, Dr. Saman Nasser from George Washington on African-American COVID-19 mortality. I'm gonna keep it short because this is a conversation among friends, but I think it was important for us to recognize that the idea of these disparities is not social science, this is medicine, this is hard science, this is mortality, it's something that we all should be concerned with. Thank you, Dr. Ferdinand. Um, so, uh, continuing with the same topic of, of how to reach patients um, in regards to using virtual care or telemedicine, um, there again, as we, as we talked about, multiple different types of disease processes. Um, how do you envision um, the ability to build a telemedicine platform that would be on a community level? Well, I, I'll just start off. I think one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic did, it pushed Medicare and many of the private payers to pay for telehealth virtual visits at the same rate as an in-clinic visit. The other thing is that for those older patients who had difficulty with using the laptop or even the smartphone, some of the CMS reimbursement now for just the telephone visit, even without the smartphone or the laptop, is equal to that out of an inpatient visit. So it pushed clinicians to overcome that reluctance that somehow they would not be reimbursed for their telehealth. So if I may take the liberty, uh, Keith, uh, of adding one more statistic uh, to your wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, on a daily basis, there are 287 black people who die prematurely because of health inequity. Uh, and that number kind of really stands out when you put it in the context of COVID-related deaths by itself. I mean, this is happening on a daily basis of because of health inequity. And, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll get into the discussion uh, and, and a large part of that inequity is a direct consequence of, you know, the lack of access uh, to care. Uh, and even when the access to care is there, there is a lack of quality of care. Um, so, I, and I think, you know, one of the big issues that comes up with telemedicine is that Telemedicine is a great tool, but does it really, can we really access those patients who are already having this health inequity? Do they have the right infrastructure to be able to receive our, uh, you know, entry into their house to talk to them 
uh, for telemedicine and, and how do we kind of go about that I think is is going to be a, a big challenge uh, because there are many uh, layers that we have to cross to get to that point. I think um, I would agree so many things that the two of you have said already are, are, are ripe for conversation but um, getting the right population to care is important so when we go back to use cases Dr. Ferdinand like you were kind of starting to talk about too um, when we look at this population, chronic disease actually affects the at-risk population that we're talking about, right? The, the Hispanic and black population far more than it does the non-Hispanic um, and the non-black population. And so the diabetes, the hypertension, the heart failure, and those are exactly the things that telemedicine is extraordinarily good at caring for when done right when the systems can be in place because they require continuous, not episodic care. And those are populations who can't necessarily afford to come in. And, and if you relate it to socioeconomic status, these are hourly wage workers a lot of the time. And so we're taking away their livelihood by saying you must come to me when actually you don't need to. I can get a lot of information from you in the community where you live. Um, may I share a slide? Would that be okay for one second? Yes, please. I'm going to... Um, Let's hope I get this one right. We practiced this before, so um, here we go. Are you able to see it? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm gonna skip this one because Dr. Ferdinand did this beautifully, um, but I'm going to show you the next one. So this is from the World Health Organization, and I saw this earlier this week um, and, and was shocked by it. Um, in 122 countries that were studied, this is a look at um, how we approached the disruptions in chronic disease care, so non-communicable disease care, um, how we approached that uh, during COVID. And what you can see is the dark green here, and I couldn't fit on here. The dark green is um, an attempt to use a telemedicine visit. And the light green is just an attempt to reach the patient to triage uh, the level of illness, triage acuity. And just look at the difference. There's 122 different countries between the low income patients and how often we use telemedicine globally and how often we try and triage their acuity versus the high income patients. So I would say that I think uh, Jag is exactly right. We are not utilizing the ideas that we have in this population and our first job is to figure out really, and I'll stop screen sharing now, but our first job is to really figure out um, why Right, why is it that we can't reach that low income population? And some of it is gonna be structural. Uh, we have to, I think I wanna bring that up kind of up front. Some of it is gonna be structural, it's gonna be broadband. It's going to be, I can't do a video visit because I only have X number of um, minutes on my phone to talk to you. I only have so much bandwidth for video. Um, and we're not alone in that the global community for education, there's so many other groups who are looking to improve that kind of access. So I, I do think both globally, we're not alone. We're trying telemedicine, but we're, we're hitting the high income before the low income. And I think community-wise, we're not alone in that access to the mechanics of telemedicine care is the same thing for digital education delivery they have the same problems we do. So I think we can partner in the community to make a difference. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Amy. Uh, if you look at patients who have smartphones, it actually is fairly common even in disadvantaged communities. Unfortunately, sometimes their minutes may be limited. They may be limited wireless reception where they are. So you may not be able to get the comprehensive virtual visit as you could in a more stable environment. Fortunately, as I mentioned before, there is now in CMS, because of the pandemic, reimbursement even for the telephone visit. Not as good. You can't see the patient and have that visual connection. You can't look at the leg or look at a rash. But it still is a way of expanding the office hours, expanding your availability, bringing the family into the conversation who may be there in the home, of course, with HIPAA rules being adhered to, but it may actually be a little bit better than the person who has to catch the bus, wait 45 minutes to transfer, yeah. sit outside for 30 minutes, and then get that magic 15 minutes that we give them. We come and stand over them, mumble some stuff, and walk out. And yes, the sir. patient is supposed Spot to remember on, all the yeah. lists of... Uh, 
you know, one of the issues, however, is telemedicine works well for a lot of people, uh, but it still became becomes a bit, bit of an issue to really get to those, you know, the, the core group of patients who need it the most. Um, and, and, you know, if you're trying to prevent chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, as, as Ami said, you need continuous monitoring strategies out here uh, to prevent progression of disease, and obviously that will then prevent cardiovascular disease. And, and the big question out here is how do we kind of get it to that level uh, for those patients that need it the most? There's reimbursement now for self-monitored blood pressure. And the American Heart Association and AMA just came out with a position paper. You, you can find it easily on the web suggesting that self-monitored blood pressure may even be superior to the clinic blood pressure because you can get a better idea of blood pressure load. Of course, the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is the gold standard. But if a person measures the blood pressure at home twice a day for an extensive period of time, you can get that sense of blood pressure load and a better predictor of target organ damage and actual blood pressure numbers than, again, that magic 15 minutes that's in the clinic often done inappropriately. Sure. And it's interesting because this is where, um, I guess a couple things, we were talking about this kind of before we started, who do we need to partner with in order to be able to make these things happen? Um, and I think one thing is asking some of these people to go out and buy a blood pressure cuff um, that's gonna work is, is probably unreasonable. There are population mm -hmm. health measures, there are large companies who have the ability um, to be able to donate, to be able to grant fund, um, and so I think picking those communities is important. The other part though, to get in the community is, this isn't new. When we think about us in telemedicine, getting into the community and overcoming social determinants of health has been a mission for many people for a long time. And the most successful communities are the ones who partner with the local religious organization and the Boys and Girls Club and the local pharmacy. Um, and already have an infrastructure. And so I think one thing we need to do is allow them to leverage us and say, we have a system, can we bring you in and here is where we might need you um, rather than for us to do the thing that sometimes we do as cardiologists, which is we will come in and show you how to solve it. Um, and so I do think to kind of answer Jag's question um, and, uh, and repeat what you said, Dr. Ferdinand, to get into the community, you need to use the people who are there. Um, and, and really, and, and that should be a way that we get there. So, okay. so, Ami, that, you know, just to be the devil's advocate out here, I think that's oftentimes easier said than done. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's nice when we do it at the individual level and we think that we could do it at the individual level, but you need a more systemic strategy that is top down within an institution to be able to actually implement that. Uh, and much of that depends on what the mission of that institution is. Uh, is it a fee-for-service institution that is based on profit, uh, or is the core mission of the institution one to actually make people healthier? Uh, and, and that, you know, is, 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 and that depends on leadership. So yeah, like I said, I wasn't I going would... to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I actually think that we're making a big mistake when we do the wallet biopsy where we show our bias for the person who has the private insurance versus the person who has no insurance because the uninsured patients are going to get care and we're going to pay for that care because they're going to use the emergency department as their primary source of care when do you go when their legs are swollen they can't breathe they have heart failure when they can't urinate now they have in-state dream disease when they have slurred speech and blurred vision they're, they're threatening a stroke all of which would have been preventable if we had insured everyone, gave them identifiable source of care, made it easy to get appropriate referral to specialists and imaging when they needed it, we would actually end up saving dollars. I, I can't tell you why our society doesn't get that, but that's, that's very clear to me. No, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think every institution looks at, and I, and I you know, I, I'm going to speculate a little bit out here. Uh, every institution looks at the extent of engagement uh, also from the return on investment angle. Um, and, and because of that, you know, how 
much of an effort it directs towards really implementing change uh, versus lip service is again variable across the country. Um, and I think having some sort of broader insurance coverage strategy uh, can mitigate some of that uh, impact as, as you just alluded to. Uh, but I think that at the same time, it's important for institutions to recognize that the return on investment is actually better health and better health eventually translates into reduced healthcare costs. Uh, and the returns can come back depending on what the, uh, <clears throat> what the strategy is, whether it's a shared savings strategy or whatever the payment strategies are. So those are just some of the issues I so, think that really need to be taken Dr. into consideration. Singh, Dr. Singh, would you, so in a situation like that, when, and I agree there's always the question about the financial aspect of it um, versus the healthcare of a community, but sometimes that doesn't have to be two separate questions. Um, I, I would make an argument that remote monitoring with the current codes that we have on a, on a good platform would actually would be financially beneficial for a, an institutional system if they set it up correctly. If you, were to, if you were to go out to the community, provide them very simple Bluetooth blood pressure devices that connect to their cell phones, that connects to your EHR system, with which virtually a simple AI system to monitor uh, um, the, the, the very high, very low uh, glucose or blood pressure or so forth, you would actually, and, and, and you still be able to build with the current codes that we have for remote monitoring, you would make an argument, or I could make an argument that you would have a much broader uh, patient population that are managed by that institution. Without a doubt. Without a doubt, I think you'll do a lot more good that way. Uh, but institutions may not necessarily look at it from the same perspective. And, you know, I'm, I'm generalizing out here, so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Uh, but I think the issue is that when you go into telemedicine, you're also, because you can provide care from a distance, you don't feel obligated to test. You don't feel obligated to image. You don't do all the ancillary testing which is very useful for the hospital, uh, you know, finances. Yeah. Uh, so that, again, plays into some of the decisions that are made into how aggressively to promote the strategy. But I am totally with you that I think telemedicine is here to stay. It is the right way to go. It is going to actually convert, you know, 70% of outpatient care uh, to care at the home. Uh, and a lot of inpatient care also is going to become outpatient care or become telemedicine care. So it is the right way to go. There is no way backwards. Uh, it's just that we need to kind of figure out mm -hmm. how to get there faster rather than let the system play out itself. I think if we're talking about systematic progress, one of the things that has helped me in my kind of understanding is to think about what those different areas of telemedicine are. And so there is the preventative health get there in the community, make people a healthier arm. And, and that certainly exists. That is not a money maker in the short term. In the long term, we all know it's the right thing to do. Um, I think then there's the chronic disease management, demonstrating, um, and there have been studies on this, right? We have fewer heart failure readmissions because we have more touch points. And sometimes it's just more touch points, but that's what telemedicine offers very easily for the patient and the provider. Um, there is chronic glucose monitoring, there is blood pressure monitoring for hypertension. So I think that's a different bucket where we're really talking to the population health folks and saying, we need to be invested in this. But if we want to make the argument that every institution should do this, there is also the, I am going to reach out to the community and catch people sooner for their intervention. And now we want to be careful not to think about, you know, patients as a commodity, if you will. But at the same time, the sooner we reach someone for an appropriate intervention, the more likely we are to be successful at that intervention, reduce mm -hmm. their length of stay, and have them have a better outcome long term, the happier they are with our system, and therefore they choose our hospital again. Um, and you can't do that with the static number of clinic rooms you have in any given office, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of chronic disease patients who are in that space who would prefer not to be actually. They spend too much time in the hospital. And so I think that is one of those trade-offs that may actually speak to the C-suite at the same time that it speaks to our kind of public health group. But we haven't studied it enough 
And I do think that that's where we fall short. We have very little scientific rigor behind telemedicine so far. Maybe the heart failure population is the furthest ahead, um, but I think without that scientific rather rigor and groups like ours, AHA, ACC, really supporting that in large scale, we're never gonna be able to make the argument. We're gonna have the conceptual discussion. And I do think we need to put that academic prowess to work and say, look, we showed it to you, now pay for this. Um, and, and I have a feeling that that's still one part that's really important that's missing and I hope will drive that further, you know, through discussions like this and, and the audience who's out there. Let me put in a plug for the blood pressure community. There is a coalition of AHA and AMA, it's called Target BP, and you can find it at targetbp.org. They actually have Validate BP, which is a site where they actually use an evaluation, an objective evaluation of the worth of the home blood pressure units. And they have data at that site that shows that they may even have better control. You clearly can identify patients with white coat effect or white hypertension, white coat hypertension. And you can identify patients with mass hypertension when they come to the clinic, so-called normal, but then if they're using a valid machine with appropriate technique, uncontrolled hypertension. So specifically related to blood pressure, I think heart failure, you're right, but I think blood pressure is right there in terms of having good data that home monitoring is a, a way to go. That's great. Without a doubt, yeah. And you know, Jack, um, there's, and you probably know this as well as I do, there are actually now data trying to look more at using self-monitored watches for arrhythmia detection. So, so I'm an EP guy, as, as I know. That's why I gave you that soft. They call it <laughs> the high softball, right? High <laughs> softball. I'm going to take it. So, so you know, um, I grew up with a remote monitoring since 2005, 2006, because we've been looking at implanted devices and looking at all the data, the device diagnostics from these devices to manage our patients uh, for a number of years. Uh, so, so the remote aspect of telemedicine came naturally, I think comes naturally to a lot of electrophysiologists because in 2005 or 2006, when they first started remote monitoring, I, I can tell you that a lot of us electrophysiologists had seizures because we thought it would be impossible for our patients not to see us on a three monthly basis uh, with their devices. And now we see them once a year uh, and soon it will be once every two years. It's the whole phenomenon that AMI raised of continuous care. So it becomes exception-based care you kind of see them only when it's exceptional, that things are looking that they're about to go out of whack, when there's a biological process that triggers, uh, you know, one of the alerts that you've set up in these devices. So, so I think there's a lot of similarities out here between remote monitoring with devices and using sensor strategies, uh, especially in the heart failure population. I think having device data downloads of heart failure diagnostics along with um, you know, a virtual visit is a complete objective visit. I mean, it is providing you enough information about what their heart failure status is uh, that you don't need anything else. And, and I think folks are moving in that direction right now. I will, uh, I'll tell you, this is, a, this is a real time, real life issue. So this morning we had some conversations as we're reopening you know, services um, because Boston really did have to shut down for a period of time from March through May. And uh, the you know heart failure group, the valve disease group, they, they needed clinic rooms. They needed to get their hands on the patients um, for those who didn't have implanted devices. Um, and uh, we said, well, we'll open at 25%. They, they said, maybe we need 50% capacity. And the electrophysiology team said, we're gonna stick with virtual. We'll let you know when we need a room. And so you can really tell that, that, that you guys are advanced in this ability to do things remotely. Um, but it doesn't mean that the rest of us can't also get there. I think it's a great use case for, for how virtual works. You know, New Orleans was another hot spot along with New York and Boston. And ours was because of Mardi Gras, which was February 25th. I was out there in the street with everyone else. It was a beautiful day. But three weeks later, we had a COVID crisis on hand and the convention center was actually an overflow hospital. The point being that now they're trying to re-energize the inpatient care unrelated to COVID and get the clinics going again, 
especially some of the older patients and patients who have been sensitized to their high risk status don't want to come in. They would rather do the virtual visit. That's very true. Uh, maybe I'll put in a little plug just uh, for fun for those who are, are listening before people um, um, uh, start thinking about the fact that maybe not everybody listening has a telemedicine system. I think um, we're fortunate now we have experience with heart failure or EP or, or um, hypertension patients. So um, the uh, American College of Cardiology um, has actually partnered with Heartbeat Health. Um, and you can go to the ACC website and find the information. So for um, 2020, it's actually a free telemedicine service, video telemedicine service. Um, you can use it uh, off of a, um, uh, right off of your phone to, to speak with patients. Um, and we're really trying to build into it some of this remote monitoring. So I'm looking to see how telemedicine can particularly be useful for cardiologists, because there's a lot of platforms out there, but you know, they're used, Zoom is used for school and for medicine and for other things. And it's not particularly for medicine alone. Um, so for those who may not have a system and are interested, um, Heartbeat Health through ACC is free for the year. Um, so your practice may wanna try and, uh, and use it and, and give feedback. No, perfect. So another question that always came up was, um, you know, during fellowship and during training, um, the data and the, the, the literature that we read is usually not, um, let's say, or trials or trial data is not necessarily directed toward minorities, unless it's a specific minority um, study. Um, so what can or what should we do? Um, I want to give your opinion about how can we kind of work a little bit more harder on our training trainees in regards to more specific um, disease processes in minorities, African-American, Hispanic, refugees, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, well, you know, I, I live that world. And one of the things that is often overlooked is that these clinical trials have to make an effort. If you look at some of the newer devices and some of the new medications, the percentages of minorities in some of those clinical trials is one, two, three percent. Yeah. And you really are going to miss some of the nuances on how people may respond. NHLBI and NIH trials will over-select for racial and ethnic minorities and for women because they are now aware that if you're going to take new devices and new therapies and apply them across a heterogeneous broad population, you need to show that those particular interventions are beneficial. If you don't do that, you have the unintended consequence of then doing a subgroup analysis and it may go the wrong way for women, or it may go the wrong way for Hispanics or Asians, or it may go the wrong way for self-identified Blacks. So you're better off by making sure that you enroll a population which is diverse and the subgroups are robust so that when you do that analysis, you don't get a type one error and you come out with things like, well, this drug is really great, but it doesn't work in this population or that population. Yeah. If I may add to that, Keith, you know, I, I think the training has to change a little bit. Um, I think recognizing social disparities has to be an active part of the training uh, at the residency level, at the medical school level, but even at the fellowship level. I think people need to be reminded, uh, you know, they, that there is reminded that there is a need to cover that gap. Uh, with science especially. And, and I'm gonna to touch back on one of the points that Ami brought up is that care is going to evolve from the conventional transactional care to a continuous form. Um, and along with continuous care, you can only imagine that there is going to be um, a, a predictive analytics approach that will be used with that digital data that comes out so that we can predict and prevent disease in the future. Now, if patients of different races are not included, you can only imagine that all those AI algorithms that are going to come out are going to be extraordinarily biased uh, and non-representative of, of patients of color. Uh, so I think, it, you know, as we actually enter into the whole field of artificial intelligence, which is now, as we know, is, is just getting more and more active, 
Um, I think we really need to rethink our diversity, our equity and inclusion criteria actively amongst our cardiology fellows. The other thing I feel very strongly about is, and I think this should be across not just cardiology, but every um, division is, is really have a diversity dashboard that you look at on a daily basis so that it's not relevant only for clinical trials uh, or recruitment, but across the board. Um, and, and because if we don't see the data and we don't constantly keep measuring it, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to make any changes. Yeah, I am. Um, I have three disparate thoughts. They're all in response to this. But uh, the first is um, I hear this often and I think it's true. Um, you start talking about trainees and, and how young we go. Um, we don't really have physicians who look like the patients we're trying to get to. The number of Hispanic and, and black young individuals who are coming up through med school and into cardiology fellowship is still um, is still quite low. And so I do think that that needs to be an active effort whenever we talk about trainees is to make sure that we you know, find um, people and we change that balance. And so I think that's going to help us get the right patient population cared for. Um, because there's an inherent thought, if, if they don't know what my life is like, how do they know how to care for me? Um, and I think that's true kind of globally. It's, it's not specific to one group. Um, the second thought was actually about a, a group when we were talking about how do you get to a certain group, um, in Puerto Rico, um, there was um, Salud para Piñones, I think. So Piñones is this area in Puerto Rico um, that is geographically separate from others and then also happens to be a Black Hispanic area. If anybody who is listening knows this better than me, please go ahead and chime in on the chat. Um, but interestingly, that is where community-based participatory research was really well defined as to how do you get into the community and get these people to trust that when you enroll them in these trials, right, that it is the right trial for them that we're doing it because we are making the assumption that we're just going to open the doors and say, these people are going to come and sign up. And I don't know that that trust exists. So um, for those who are looking at really making a change in their trial design, who are doing clinical trials, um, that, is, uh, that is probably um, just a, a case uh, report or whatever you want to call it, that, that you want to read and take a look at how they did it. Um, it took a lot of effort and it took building trust in the community. And, and even for telemedicine, we're going to need to build trust in these communities, that we're committed to them, that this is not something that we're just trying to do to show we can do it. And once COVID's gone, we'll be gone. Um, but I think uh, it, was a, it was a really impressive um, effort that they made and a challenging one, but it teaches us how to do it too. And and, and I Ami, mean, just to kind of add to that, I, I think every community uh, will have an individualized strategy. You can't have a one size fit all strategy across all different races and different communities. And I, and I think that's where, you know, that partnership is so important. Um, and that's where I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the leadership in the institutions needs to really kind of make, uh, take some forward steps in that direction. You know, we talked about telehealth in terms of controlling risk factors, identifying arrhythmias, et cetera. But the other thing that I think it does, and it's inherent in what we've been saying, but I, we need to put it out there. It educates the patient. An informed patient will not allow the busy clinician to just say your blood pressure was okay. Well, how was my blood pressure today? Oh, it was okay. No, no, no. What was the number? I had blood drawn two weeks ago. What was my A1C? I had a lipid panel, what was my LDL? And sometimes we as clinicians get mixed up, especially with patients who have poor health literacy or less education, we think that they're less intelligent. But that's not at all. If you empower the patient and telemedicine has that ability because you're able to have more touch points and you're able to communicate directly with the patient and his or her family, that patient's actually going to be a better patient because they're going to challenge you to do the right thing. Absolutely. I think the one other thing about that patient advocating for themselves is they're on equal footing. They are in their home, in their comfort space. They are not in a gown in some white clinic room where you stand above them. And so the minute you give anybody a little equality, I think it's a better relationship on both sides. So I absolutely agree. I think telemedicine empowers them partly just by showing respect. I'm coming to you. 
you don't have to come to me. I'm coming to you. It says and, a lot. And this is where I think, you know, the payers and the insurers should all realize that with patient participation and patient self-management, which eventually I think the whole thing we're talking about, virtual care, which is sensorated, uh, powered by predictive analytics, will eventually also lead to self-management strategies that patients will be educated and they'll be able to use algorithms to kind of go down at least a simple strategy that they may need to change their medications. Um, I think they need to incentivize that uh, approach also because it's only going to save money uh, for the payers and the healthcare system overall. Well, CMS is going to have a quandary because the reimbursement for virtual visits and then they change it also to the reimbursement for telephone visits equal to that of in-clinic visits was supposed to be an emergency maneuver because of the pandemic. Right. Somebody's going to declare, I don't know who, that the pandemic is over, so no longer are we going to reimburse for telehealth. And that's going to probably be a fairly chaotic day in all of our lives. Yeah, the um, Massachusetts State Senate is voting sometime within the next week on extending those telemedicine services beyond the state of emergency to make them something that is more permanent. So if our state is uh, is doing the right thing and gets that passed, um, I hope it sets an example for other states too. Amy, you really should recognize that there are a bunch of other states that are not as forward thinking as Massachusetts and California. <laughs> you all, you all aware of that, right? <laughs> It might be my implicit bias slash yeah. hope. <laughs> well, I, well, I think the you know, and I don't want the COVID uh, you know era to continue, but it's clearly I think not going away for several months, uh, if not a couple of years, uh, and I think it would uh, probably be extraordinarily unfair for them to revoke uh, telehealth, even in the telephone form. And I think if it carries on for the next several months to a year or so, it'll be so well baked into the system uh, that they're going to find it challenging to suddenly pull the plug on it. Yeah, it's also not in communities' best interest because you can't take people out of communities that are trying to rebuild to go get their chronic disease care, mm -hmm. um, especially those communities at highest risk have the highest rates of chronic disease. And uh, you take those people out of those communities, that's work that's not happening, that's a community that's not rebuilding. So it's actually not in town and city's favor. Um, to get rid of that. Hopefully. Now, something I have not done, but I know Cleveland Clinic did initiate this in some patients. Patients who have a diagnosis of COVID-19, give them a thermometer and an oximeter and let them monitor their clinical care to see if they need to come for inpatient care. Do you, are you, have you heard of that? Or are you aware of that? So, so there are, I know that this has been done in other countries as well as in our uh, our country out here that they've tried to categorize patients as mild, moderate, and severe COVID. Severe get admitted. Moderate can go go home with the sensor strategies for monitoring. But give them the oximeter in the home environment. Correct. To report. Correct. In terms of the blood pressure cuffs, um, I think Amy's right. The, the cost may be a barrier. I have seen some analyses where you can give the patient the blood pressure and with the reimbursement for monitoring self-monitoring, which is an ongoing uh, payment to the physician. It's once a month, it's not a lot, it might be $15, $20, but it can recoup the 40 or $35 for a validated blood pressure cuff. And, and then there are also sensor strategies that are being developed to measure blood pressure off the PPG of the smartphone. Um, and that's not going to be very far away. So I, I think the technology is only going to advance that uh, one could easily measure blood pressure, heart rate, arrhythmias, all off your smartphone itself. Yeah, there, there's one of the commercial uh, companies that has a smart watch that actually measures blood pressure. I don't use it. It's not part of the valid Validate BP website that I was talking about. And the risk blood pressures, some of them are pretty good if you use completely, absolutely meticulous technique. But for many patients, when you start talking about the watch and the wrist and the finger, right. I get a little bit you know, suspicious about yeah, those. I, I think any technology will need to be validated first. And I think 
then on top of that validated by us during an in-clinic visit to see if it's truly representative of the blood pressure that is recorded from the arm cup versus one of these technologies to get some level of comfort. My last comment related to social justice is that I, I was talking about the cost of care and the disparities that relates to mortality. I do that to get everyone's attention. I really think it's a social issue. You need to treat everybody the same regardless of their wallet. We can't do wallet biopsies. We have to make sure that our excellent evidence-based medicine is applied across race, ethnicity, sex, gender, geography, and social class. If we're not doing that, then we are not fulfilling our calling as physicians. So I put all that stuff about the cost of care and mortality, et cetera, et cetera, because that's what people are used to saying. But I really think from a social justice point of view, we should treat everyone as best we can. Absolutely. Yeah, um, devices and, and, and so forth regarding a package that goes to a patient and then physicians or, or a practice can, re, can recuperate, recuperate the, the, that uh, amount of, I think also it's a matter of how you present it to your group or to your institution. In theory, you made an, an, an empty slot for a new patient, which now can, you could take care of another new patient or patient, I know that there's a lot of practices that have one or two month, month waits just trying to get Correct. into the practice. But if your established patients that you're trying to manage regarding blood pressure medications or monitoring of glucose or so forth, and you bring in that information that literally takes 10 minutes to right. adjust and, and so forth. I, I think it's also a matter of how you present it to your practice and to your group, saying that the 30% the or 40% patient of established patients that we manage for blood pressure, we will still get reimbursed at very reasonably for, but then now the one month wait of trying to get patients into clinic, we're able to do so and take care of the patients that need to be taken care right. of. 99474 for monitoring blood pressure, but then yeah. for the new patients, for the consultation, for the complex patients, we've opened the window. We've extended clinic hours. We've extended clinic capacity because you don't have people coming in for usual clinic chronic care that they didn't really need to come in for if you do it right. And if practices can, um, can take those numbers and share them, and publish them in whatever way people are comfortable, I think it'll make a difference. And even if you use it internally, even if you show internally what happens with those numbers, I think that's important because I, I feel like we have made this argument. I've been doing telehealth since 2013, so I feel like I've kind of been beating my head against the wall for a long time. But, but I feel like those few of us who used to do this before COVID have made that argument and, and without evidence and showing your practice that that actually happened, it's sometimes hard to believe it. So I would recommend that people measure, you know, take the data, you have it, you have it from billing data, you have it from encounter data, um, and, and take a look at it and prove the point, um, because I think you'll be able to. Well, Amy, you've been expert with this for quite a while, but who would have predicted that we'd have had such a revolution in care? Uh, it's just something that perhaps many of us were not prepared for, but it's here. And I agree with Jag, it's gonna be hard to take it away because there's now evidence that there's patient satisfaction. You can educate the patients, you keep those touch points which decrease hospitalization. And on the other side, you're able now to identify patients who may need more intensive evaluation versus waiting until they are into the throes of an acute coronary syndrome or pulmonary edema or a frank a stroke. Mm -hmm. And, and look at it from the hospital perspective, right? Um, everybody talks about asset light institutions. Uh, here you're shifting your office into the home of the patient. Um, so you're expanding your institution's uh, reach uh, without actually creating more office space for yourself. So, so I think there's something to be said about it, uh, even from the financial perspective uh, for hospitals. I think if we also think about, you know, the, the last epidemic we had before the pandemic was physician burnout, right? That was our epidemic running into COVID. And, uh, and there is something to be said for the flexibility of different types of schedules and working from home. And, 
you know, perhaps encouraging people who have families to be able to see those families more, to care for elders. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunity or just not have road rage when you arrive in clinic in the morning, <laughs> if you work in one of those, you know, areas that has a lot of traffic. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for the physician and nurse benefits of telemedicine as well, and giving some flexibility back to these people who give their lives for this kind of care. No, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, this, is, this has been great. I, I really, truly appreciate it. Um, um, as we conclude our session, we are kind of running out of time, but as we conclude our session, I would like to really thank our guests, Dr. Bott, Dr. Singh from Mass General, Dr. Ferdinand from Tulane University. Um, it's been very exciting, productive, and informative. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank for having you. us. Um, in, in the future sessions, we will be discussing many further aspects of digital health and telemedicine, um, including how to build remote monitoring clinics, presentations about coding and payments, uh, digital platform practices. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to, to direct and host this series. Um, please consider leaving us a review on our YouTube channel and mention any other topics that you would like us to consider discussing in the near future. Thank you and good night. All right. See you.